Hi all, it's Kate, and this is the fourth and last video for week three of Math 23. Let's talk about linearly independent rows for a second. In your textbook, Hubbard, you're given two arguments that the number of linearly independent rows of a matrix equals its rank, or the number of linearly independent columns. Here's another one. You can do an example on the side. Um, it's not really necessary, but it's good to sort of understand how this works. Basically, you start out with a matrix, and you swap rows so that you have a non-zero row as the top row. Then we take a look at who's going to go in the second row position. Let's choose a row that is linearly independent of the top row. Since we only care about one row, we're just looking for something that's not a scalar multiple of that top row. That's going to go in the second row position. Then things start getting tricky. You want to then put a, in the third row position, you want to swap rows so that you have something that's linearly independent of the top two rows into the third position. And it's very difficult to start doing these. This is not a particularly easy process to do because you'll frequently be using row reduction to figure out what is a linear combination of something else. But anyway, you keep doing this until you have the top R rows are linearly independent set, however many R is and then uh, each of the bottom m minus r rows, because remember that uh, we're mapping from rn to rm. So we have a matrix like this that looks like this. So in total, we have m rows, and then r of those rows are linearly independent, because we swapped them into that order, and then the rest of them, m minus r, are the ones that are linearly dependent. They can be written as a linear combination of the other rows. So the red rows can be written as a linear combination of the blue rows. So then when we start doing elementary row operations, what we can do is we can subtract off appropriate multiples of the top rows up here from the bottom rows down here. So each of these red rows can be written as a sum of scalar multiples of the blue rows. So we just want to subtract off the right number uh, multiples of the blue rows to zero out these red rows. So this is uh, really quite a long and arduous process, but because these red rows are linear combinations of the blue rows, it is doable. So what we end up doing after we're finished with all this, the top rows are totally unchanged. Those are still the way they are, and the bottom rows are just all zeros. Then we note that there's really no way for row reduction to convert any of these to a zero row because they're all linearly independent from each other. So since they can't be expressed as a linear combination of each other, you can't subtract off multiples of the other of the other rows, pardon me, and and zero them out. So interestingly enough, in echelon form, this matrix, which is now we have all the red rows have turned to zeros and we're left with the blue rows. When we row reduce it in echelon form, this matrix will have R pivotal once, one in each of these rows, because there's no way to zero out these blue rows. They can't, no matter if we subtract or swap or subtract scalar multiples, because they're linearly independent from each other, we can never zero out in one of these blue rows entirely. So once it's in echelon form, we will have R uh, pivotal once, and so we note that R is both the number of linearly independent columns, because that's where the pivotal ones show up, and it's the number of linearly independent rows, because there's one of them in each of these rows. So the rank of A is also equal to the rank of its transpose, A transpose. I would assume that this process is pretty torturous, so... Uh, without the assistance of something like R, it wouldn't be very doable uh, in, in, in practice. But it is, it is good to see that in principle, this does hold that the number of linearly independent columns is the number of linearly independent rows. Moving on. Our last topic is orthonormal bases. And orthonormal bases are just a specific type of basis that is frequently really attractive to work with. And the reason for this is that each of the vectors in the set are orthogonal to each other. They share no components in common, because remember when something's orthogonal to something else, it has a dot product of zero, and the dot product kind of encapsulates how much two vectors point in the same direction. 
So having an orthonormal basis is fantastic because each vector is orthogonal to all the other vectors and each vector is length one. So they're particularly useful to us when we're doing computations and things like that, that you don't have uh, vectors that point even somewhat in the same direction, that you have a basis for a space where each element of the basis adds something that no other element is able to, basically. So let's take a look here. Well, given this describes what it means to have an orthonormal basis. I just explained to you what that was. But given any basis of a subspace W and any vector in W, we can express by the definition of a basis. We can express that vector X as a linear combination of the basis vectors. It's important to note here that we are saying any basis. This is not necessarily an orthonormal basis. Any basis at all. Determining the coefficients here will require row reducing a matrix. We talked about that two videos ago. You can review it if you like. But what's great about orthonormal bases over other bases is that with normal base, not normal, but average, your average basis, you need to row reduce the matrix. With an orthonormal basis, all you have to do is take your particular vector and dot it with a basis vector and whatever you get is going to be the coefficient on that basis vector for you to uh, find that linear combination. What's interesting is that we can convert any set spanning set of vectors into a basis and specifically an orthonormal basis. And this process is a little bit lengthy to do by hand but very easy to automate. It's called the Gram-Schmidt process what it does is it takes a spanning set of vectors, doesn't even need to be a basis, and returns an orthonormal basis. Note that the directions here as they're written mean that you can apply the Gram-Schmidt process to any spanning set, but I'm going to talk through an example right now where we start with a regular basis where the vectors are not of any particular length, and then we apply the Gram-Schmidt process. For a basis, some of these steps are redundant. For a spanning set, they're not. And our goal is to take this average basis and turn it into an orthonormal basis, and here's how we do it. We pick the first vector listed in the basis, and we're not even going to change it. The only thing that we're going to do is we want to divide it by its length. It's going to be a unit vector. It's going to start us off. So we take W1 and divide it by its length. That's our first vector in our orthonormal basis. All right, then we take W2 out, and the thing that we need to do, we need W2 to be linearly independent of V1, so make sure that they're not scalar multiples of each other. And what we want to do is subtract off a multiple of V1 to make a vector X that is orthogonal to V1. So this is the multiple that we're actually using. We take W2 and then we subtract off W2 dot V1. Remember that's kind of like the amount, the magnitude that W2 and V1 are pointing in the same direction, and this is a vector. So subtracting off this vector basically means we're taking W2 and subtracting off the component that points in the same direction as V1. And that component is exactly scaled so that it completely eliminates their common direction pointing. So now we have X. And then we divide x by its length, and we'll have this second basis vector, v2. We started with w2. We eliminated the part of w2 that even remotely pointed in the same direction as v1. And then we divided by length to get the second basis vector. This is mentioned a bit in the dot product outline, so you might want to take a look at that. We keep doing the same thing. Note that we choose w3. We make sure that it's linearly independent of v1 and v2. We subtract off, this is the vector that is sort of the component that W3 is pointing in the same direction as V1, and this is the, um, the vector that is the component of W3 that is pointing in the same direction as V2. And so once we subtract off both of these vectors, we are now left with this modified W3 that is no longer pointing in the same direction at all as V1 or V2. And then we take that and divide it by its length. And we have a third basis vector that's length 1 that is orthogonal to both v1 and v2. And you keep going depending on how many vectors you have. 
but you keep going until you can't find any vector that is linearly independent of your basis vectors. We'll talk about this more in class. I know we'll be working on it uh, with some of the sample problems. So really once you get into the process of Gram-Schmidt, it makes a lot more sense. But what you're doing is making sure that the vectors don't in any way point in similar directions and then dividing by their length to make sure they become length one. That's it for week three. Enjoy your time in class. And as always, if you have any questions, please let me know.